All right. I'm Luke Vilness. I'm going to present some work I did with my advisor, Andrew McCallum, on embedding words as Gaussian distributions. So recently, there's been an explosion of interest in these embedding models for NLP. And the basic idea is that we can take difficult semantic questions, and we can reduce them to sort of easy geometric questions. Um, so ideas about semantic similarity can be reduced to ideas about just neighborhoods in vector space. Um, and ideas about maybe analogies can be reduced to vector arithmetic between uh, vectors representing concepts. And this has also uh, had great success in many NLP tasks like uh, noun phrase chunking and part of speech tagging. It's let people get away from manual feature engineering and do easy semi-supervised learning. Um, in name identity extraction, uh, people have gotten state of the art by sort of baking in semantic knowledge from lexicons into this embedding space. Uh, in machine translation, it's been very successful in avoiding problems with data sparsity, rare words, also for language modeling. Uh, in question answering and relation extraction, other information extraction tasks, it's really helped with dealing with these uh, sparse label and feature spaces for these very structured, complicated problems. Okay. So now all these models have been really successful, but they all represent concepts, words, features, labels as points in vector space. And if you think about, if you go kind of further with this uh, intuition that you should be turning semantic questions into geometric questions, you can see that there's a couple things missing from this approach. Um, and the first one is that there's not really an easy way to take these points and have them uh, express any kind of breadth or broadness of meaning. And there's also not an easy way to do asymmetric comparisons between these things. They, um, uh, we use cosine similarity, dot products, and uh, symmetric metrics like this. And so the idea is to design a natural extension of current embedding models that can naturally capture asymmetric comparison, inclusion or entailment of concepts, and uh, broadness of meaning. And so uh, we designed this Gaussian word embedding model. and we actually see that the word person has a, a broader bubble than the word composer. And if we add the word famous to it, in the middle we see Bach is right there, which is what we would want. Um, okay, so more concretely, in a vector embedding model, you associate, for each word in the vocabulary, you associate a single vector. And we're just proposing to instead associate a mean vector to it and a covariance matrix. And in our work we use diagonal covariance matrices, but you can use any sort, it's still very tractable. Um, and if you look kind of at the functional form of this density function that we're parametrizing, there's basically two terms. There's a logarithmic penalty on the volume, which comes from making everything normalized to integrate to one, and that sort of uh, dilutes the density as you get too spread out. And the other one is a mahal novus distance, which measures closeness according to some intrinsic metric of the concept. And so to deal with asymmetry, uh, we want to we want to look at KL divergence, and the intuition behind this is that it's this uh, log density ratio, this integral, and this sort of expresses how much one of the distributions is inside the other one. So this is saying how easy is it to encode n sub j, uh, to encode n sub i inside n sub j, and if you look at this visualization, it sort of kind of shows you that the part where p is inside of q uh, decreases your distance, and the part where p is outside of q increases it. So this is kind of a natural candidate. Uh, for modeling this inclusion. Okay, and if we look at the functional form of this, it also has a nice interpretation. The first term says that our variance direction should be aligned, the uh, broader concept should be broad in the direction that the other concept is. Uh, the other one says we should have a small distance between our means. And then the third term uh, is another one of these uh, penalties coming from normalization. And we actually find um, later that if we tweak this term here and allow some concepts to be more spread out, it, it actually works even better for our tasks. Okay, so how do we learn vector word embeddings? So a standard vector word embedding, the idea is that we see a sequence of context, say from Wikipedia, this is a Wikipedia article, and we are measuring the energy of two vectors, two words, uh, similarity with each other by just a dot product. Uh, and in this uh, kind of demo, I'm going to have, we want the energy to be high, sometimes people want the energy to be low, but this is our convention. So we sample a word in context, like musician, and that's a positive example. And then we're going to sample a random word from the dictionary, say banana, and that's a negative example. And we just want to basically rank 
a uh, positive example, musician and composer above composer and banana, and that's gonna get us everything similar the way we want. So we want to increase the energy like this. Okay, so how would we extend this to Gaussians? Um, if we look at our energy, it just looks like this dot product. It's the sum over component-wise products. And so we can think of it as this discrete integral. And if we do that, there's kind of a natural way to extend it to continuous functions, where we just replace it like this. Um, and this is like a very natural idea, and it's actually been done before by Tony Jabara. It's called the probability product kernel, so we'll just abbreviate it PPK later. And what's nice is because the Gaussian is a stable distribution, this actually just turns into another evaluation of a Gaussian PDF, and it's differentiable. We can backpropagate to all the parameters. Okay, um, and this has a nice functional form too. This basically tells us that if we want two things to be close together, we can either make their means closer together, or we can spread out their uncertainties in a direction that's uh, aligned towards where the, the mean of the other distribution is. And then we have this other sort of regularization term that penalizes us for getting too big. Uh, so this is, this is a nice interpretation. There's also, you can look at it as just this area here. So it's this symmetric kind of overlap measure, and it's this blue area. Okay. So to train this, uh, we just use a standard like max margin ranking loss, and we just want the energy of one to be higher than the other. We can also actually train directly using that KL divergence from before. If we have some kind of actual asymmetric supervision, um, say that we have some, some idea about what concepts should entail other concepts. Okay, so there's a lot of related work uh, in word embeddings, but uh, specifically for asymmetric comparisons and uh, natural encodings of asymmetric comparisons between embeddings, there's been some work in the sparse distributional community. Um, because if you have a sparse word vector, it's sort of this bag of context. It's like a set, and there's natural ways to look at the way one could include the other, um, but not in dense. And we've actually seen also in recent work that, that people have found that dense or distributed uh, predictive representations can be better than count-based sparse ones. And of course, there's lots of work in, in symmetric dense uh, uh, language models and word embedding models. Um, this is also somewhat similar to Bayesian matrix factorization in that we're associating uh, a sort of a Gaussian prior to everything, but we're learning the whole thing by backpropagation and not by Bayes rule. Um, in this case, it's, it's similar to mixture density networks or density networks where you parameterize a uh, distribution by a neural net and also kind of the converse, a uh, GP neural net where you push a Gaussian process through a neural net and have uh, Gaussians at every, every level. Okay. So we're gonna look at a few experiments. The first one is we have this intuition about KL divergence and asymmetric uh, comparisons and hierarchies, and we wanna just use some synthetic data and confirm that our intuition is right, that these, uh, this is a, a something that, that captures that. So we just have some simple uh, tree-type structures um, as our training data. And the idea is we just wanna say child entails parent, so child is, is included inside parent. And uh, we're gonna do this, um, we're just trying to push the bubble inside the other bubble, right? And uh, we're gonna do this by optimizing KL divergence directly, actually. And we do all this, we actually see that you can learn all these inclusions the way you'd want to. And uh, you can see that the, the sibling nodes aren't incredibly spread out here because that's not part of the objective, but we accurately learn all of the containments we want. So on some non-synthetic data for this kind of task, we actually train on this uh, data set of about 6,000 uh, entailing pairs uh, uh, from WordNet. Or rather, we don't train on it, we test on it, we train unsupervised. And uh, the idea here is that we have positive examples, adrenaline is a neurotransmitter, pizza is a food, um, but uh, then we also have two types of negative examples. There's sort of nonsense negative examples like air crew and playlist, and those are very easy to learn. And there's also reversed examples like whether food is a pizza, a molecule is a carbohydrate. Um, so when we do this, we, we train two models, one with diagonal variances and one with spherical variances. And we train on a billion tokens of Wikipedia, three billion of Newswire, so about four billion tokens total and uh, evaluate in two ways. Um, first with F1 uh, at the optimal operating point, which would just be to take the KL divergence or whatever metric we're using and to take a classifier that was predicting at the optimal point to get the best answer. And the other is just through average precision of whether we can rank entailing pairs above non-entailing pairs. So when we do this, we see that we handily beat the best previous result using these sparse word representations with our predictive representation. 
Um, and then also that diagonal variances give like a full two point boost in average precision over spherical variances. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a good result. Um, we also want to try some word similarity tasks because we've shown that we can capture these asymmetric relationships, but we want to make sure that we haven't given up too much um, and that we can still model the kind of symmetric uh, relationships that people use word embeddings for. So we use a suite of word similarity tasks. For example, words in 353 is one. There's all these uh, data sets. They look like this, basically. Uh, you have human annotators. Um, they rank similarity of words on a scale of 1 to 10. And uh, you just look at the Spearman's rank correlation of your model's similarity predictions with these similarity predictions. Um, and so money and bank are similar, uh, according to the annotators. And professor and cucumber are not particularly similar. Uh, and then sort of everything in between. Um, and so when we do this, we see that uh, basically, okay, we train again uh, two models, a diagonal and a spherical model, and we see that we do kind of as well or better than Skipgram on these various tasks. And in general, uh, we compare both using the means and using the means and the variances to see what we're getting. And when we use these spherical Gaussians, it doesn't really matter for the symmetric purpose, uh, the variance too much, but when we use the diagonal, you really need to use uh, uh, the variance. Okay. So we kind of established that these work well for asymmetric comparisons, they work well for symmetric comparisons, um, and that kind of covers the asymmetry part of, of our goal, but we also want to look at the breadth or broadness and how can we um, maybe leverage broadness of meaning in these representations in the future. Um, and so we have some just uh, qualitative kind of results here on using this for phrase finding. Um, and the idea here is that if you had this kind of a, a diagram and you knew that the Navier-Stokes equations were somewhat specific and physics was a broad concept uh, and CFD and all that, um, what could you use this for? And we're really interested in extracting uh, salient phrases from research papers, so things that you might find as like keywords underneath the abstract. And the notion here is that what makes a good key phrase? Um, you want a fairly high frequency word, but you don't just want it to be high frequency. Um, you want it to be somewhat predictive of its context. So to give a concrete example, um, frequent but non-predictive phrases are things like the paper describes or experimental results. This is not a useful keyword. Um, and so a predictive but infrequent phrase, it's very specific, but it's too infrequent to be a good keyword, is in our data things like autocorrelation function uh, didn't, didn't show up much. And so what you really want is this kind of combination of being able to predict your context and be frequent. Um, and this is kind of a TF-IDF type concept. So things like operational semantics and regular languages. And we run this on all our data. We really see this. What we do is we sort by, um, we sort by uh, the frequency, and then we sort by the variance, inverse variance, and then we take the difference of those rankings. And so we look at uh, frequent and predictive things. And we get this, this kind of keyword that you'd want, uh, linear matrix inequality, satisfiability. Uh, and then on the other end, we get things that are not only uninformative, but you would never see in a paper, like hot topic. OK. So in conclusion, um, we introduced Gaussian word embeddings. The idea is to uh, naturally capture asymmetry, broadness of meaning, and to use an expressive and dense representation. It also is very scalable learning by stochastic gradient. Um, it would train on 4 billion tokens in about eight hours on, a, on an old machine. And we have a lot of ideas for future work here. Um, we want to move to kind of uh, unnormalized models, multiple peaked models, um, and non-Gaussian distributions. We want to model more interesting things like relations and semantic frames. And uh, also to try this out in other domains because we think that this uh, notion of moving past vectors and going to these densities could be very interesting. Uh, thank you. Mm. would 
explain certain examples of things like a lamp is similar to the moon and a moon is similar to a ball, but a ball and a, ball and a lamp are similar. Um, right? And also those can kind of represent commoners, uncommoners, but it would be interesting to know that at least some of those kind of properties that you actually model better. Um, and before finishing, I mean, obviously, it seems like this is something that still needs to go further, right? Mm. It, it seems like it can't possibly be right that everything's else here. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I think uh, to this, basically you're talking about whether the triangle inequality or something like that holds. And I think that if you have, uh, I'm actually not sure if it holds with these Gaussians because all of their matrices are positive definite that they, uh, that they measure distance with. So I would have to uh, think about that. But certainly if you introduce multiple prototypes or multiple peaks and you start looking at maybe max pooling over senses, you can get away from this triangle inequality. Specifically, I think that's a good idea. Um, they were a little interesting to use as features just plugged into some other model, the way people do with a lot of word representations, because it's not quite clear how to put that vector in there. But uh, we do have ideas about doing that maybe in, in more of like a, a GP neural net kind of way. If you have a similarity with yeah. softmax on it, then you're in business. Sure, yeah, for, if you want to do it that way for a language model and just get your categorical distribution that way, that's a good idea. I see. Um, yes, we didn't find, so for, for skip grammar, sort of basic vector models, we didn't find like a huge improvement from using the extra dimensions. Um, on, the, on the word similarity, kind of everything goes up a little bit. Um, and actually one thing that's interesting for the Gaussians is that we found that the model capacity actually seemed a bit lower in that uh, because you have this variance, it causes your model to be a bit or like axis aligned, it gets spikier, um, and which we, we found uh, if you look at the distribution of components, it was, it was more spiky. So it has sort of, it might actually benefit from uh, a bigger, bigger dimensionality or even I think once you move to, to maybe a low rank plus diagonal structure or something like that, you could get away from some of the, the spikiness. All right, thank you very much. Cool. Thanks.